welcome to this webinar on the yin and yang of diagnosing MPS2, suspecting and testing. And uh, my name is Roberto Giuliani. I am from Porto Alegre, Brazil. A disclaimer from this webinar is sponsored by Takeda. Takeda. And uh, we have here our disclosures. And so the agenda. We have two main parts. First, the in about suspecting MPS2. And we'll uh, uh, approach two topics. One is the pitfall arising as a result of MPS being a rare disease. And the other point is the pitfall arising when MPS2 is less common than other MPS diseases. So we'll talk about these two points. And the second part of the seminar will be the young, testing for MPS2. We'll talk about the current diagnostic testing procedure and the future directions of diagnostic testing, either on the molecular genetics, next generation sequencing, and on biochemical approach, the non-reducing end gag analysis. And then we'll have a question and answer session. And, and this is very important. Please submit any questions you may have at any time during the presentation using the question submission box on your screen below the webinar presentation. So we can do this for now and we'll just have this question and answer session at the end of the presentations. So let's start with the, the in suspecting MPS2. I will um, start with pitfalls arising as a result of MPS2 being a rare disease. In fact, it's a ultra rare disease because, uh, and then we made a study in Brazil that was published early this year. And uh, we estimate that mucopolysaccharidosis altogether, all the 11 types of mucopolysaccharidosis, they are 1.25 uh, per 100,000, 1.25 kg per 100,000 live births. And uh, MPS2 is a part of this, is 0.37 per 100,000, which means about 30% of the MPS are MP, is a patient with MPS2 in Brazil. In other countries, this may, may vary. Some countries MPS1 is more frequent, some countries MPS6 and others MPS3. But the, in, in my country, in Brazil, is MPS2 is the most frequent, around 30% of the total of the uh, MPS patients. And um, uh, I will present a, a case study from our uh, group in, in Brazil. And uh, it's a, uh, a male, uh, uh, a baby that was born uh, as a male from non consanguineous parents and no family history of uh, MPS. Uh, and there are some data on the early childhood, like uh, a surgery for inguinal hernia. Recurrent otitis media leading to adenoidectomy and tonsillectomy, and a normal physical and psychomotor development. So the children was normal on the physical and neurological standpoint, but had uh, surgeries for inguinal hernia and uh, also for um, uh, adenoidectomy and tonsillectomy. So let's let's go on with our uh, case study. So the child is growing. At six years old, uh, uh, the, the boy was showing restrictions in joint mobility. Joint restrictions in joint mobility were noticed. And at seven years old, an echocardiography showed mild thickening of mitral and aortic valves with no uh, clinical repercussion. But this raised uh, some alert about the, this child. And uh, so at this stage, which diagnosis would you suspect? Again, the same four options. Normal childhood ailments, a disease underlying these symptoms. Now you have, a, in addition to the hernia and to the adenoidectomy and tonsillectomy, you have a joint restriction and some abnormality without clinical uh, repercussion on uh, uh, heart valves. You suspect an MPS disease, or you, you already know that this is MPS2. So think about this, and we, we will uh, discuss uh, later on. 
Okay. And then uh, at that point, the diagnosis of MPS2 was, was made. And, uh, and that, in that at diagnosis, it was noticed enlarged liver. It was not noticed before. Poor hearing, uh, disturbed in sleep was recorded and the reduced walking capacity and respiratory parameters. So this is a, a very common situation of a boy that is, uh, has uh, some common problems in the early childhood. Then some a little bit more specific abnormalities uh, as the patient grows. And the, at diagnosis, when you, you, you have the information about it, then you look for the, the abnormalities you, you find. And the, this was, uh, you may find in MPS, and then you find a lot of other, other things that you haven't noticed before. Okay, and so I, I want to stress here the, the what I say the red flags. Yeah. Well, it's a male, of course, uh, uh, to think in MPS2. Most, uh, the vast majority of MPS2 patients are male. So this is, uh, if it's not a male, you, you should think in another kind of, uh, of MPS or other disease. Surgery for inguinal hernia and adenoidectomy and tonsillectomy are very common. Uh, in early in life in MPS patients. And they may show normal physical and psychomotor development because MPS are very heterogeneous. And particularly MPS2, we have two main types, the non-neuronopathic patients that have a, a, a presentation without uh, CNS involvement, and the neuronopathic uh, patients that uh, have uh, uh, this psychomotor uh, problems with psychomotor development, and, the, and this is not the case of these patients. Restrictions in joint mobility is very common uh, in all MPS, and, and uh, again, also in MPS2. And these abnormalities in heart valves are also, also common to several MPS, including MPS2. And then the, the enlarged liver, that is what's noticed at diagnosis, is, is, is also uh, common in most MPS types. And the poor hearing as well as particularly MPS2 is, is uh, observed in most patients. Disturbed sleep, many times related to respiratory airway problems and reducing walking capacity and respiratory parameters is a combination of um, difficulties in joints and uh, air, airways and uh, maybe heart, uh, some involvement. So there are lots of red flags that we, we miss. Uh, as MPS signs al al along with the progress of the evaluations of these patients in the past. So it's something that to, we should keep in mind that, that this, uh, when you have this kind of abnormalities, this, they, this can be something that should raise the idea that this patient may have a, an MPS disease and the uh, MPS too. Regarding MPS2, the, 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 there is a particular uh, situation that uh, MPS2 is uh, the only MPS that is X-linked and it's X-linked recessive. So the carriers, they do not show any signs or symptoms of the disease. And so the, in this case, we have the mother that is a carrier and she's absolutely normal, but she can have stones with uh, uh, MPS2. And uh, the, if the daughter, daughters uh, can be carriers and they will be clinically normal as the mother. Uh, the boys can be normal if they get the normal X chromosome, but if they get the, the mutated X chromosome, they will, they will have the disease as the case of this, this boy. And the family history may be very helpful uh, because uh, if the mother may have a, a uh, the mother may have a, a, a brother that has the disease or, a, or a, uh, some male relative on the maternal side that may have the disease, and this may, may be helpful. Uh, so the maternal family history is also a head flag for suspecting MPS2. Like this, this family, we have a, a boy with the disease, but have also an uncle that is the brother of the mother who has also the disease. So this is a very typical 
and particular to MPS2 in the case of the MPS diseases. And I, as I told before, uh, we have uh, uh, MPS2, uh, you have two main types. One is the patients with no neuronopathic phenotypes. There, there is no CNS involvement. They have normal development and cognition. And then the clinical signs and symptoms usually appear later in childhood. And the early manifestations may be subtle as the, was in the, the case I presented. Um, but the, the, uh, unfortunately, the mo most patients, they have the neuronopathic phenotype. Uh, they have CNS involvement and they have delayed development of milestones in the first years of life. In fact, at the beginning, they are not, uh, they, they are, this is a progressive disease. So at the beginning, they have some uh, normal milestones, but then they plateau and then they start to do re uh, a regression. Uh, so this is important to, to mention. Uh, and the clinical signs and symptoms of this more severe form usually appear in early childhood. So I can say that about one third of the patients, they have the non-neuronopathic and two thirds of the MPS2 patients have the neuronopathic uh, phenotype. All have the somatic involvement, but the patients with the neuronopathic phenotype have in addition the CNS involvement. Why this happens? Well, this happens because we have a, a uh, disturbance on the degradation of the glycosaminoglycans. The glycosaminoglycans are the main component of the matrix of the connecti connective tissue. They are everywhere. They are in the brain, in the joints, in the heart, uh, in the liver. So they are spread uh, on our body and they are constantly synthesized and they need to be constantly uh, degraded. Otherwise they, store, they are stored. So normally what happens, they, as you see in the, in the left, they are synthesized and then there are uh, uh, enzymes that to cut down the, the, these the glycosaminoglycans to have them uh, uh, recycled in the, in the body. If, the, if one of the enzymes uh, of the degradation pathway of the guts is, is defective, then what you have? You have a, a storage of guides. And this occurs everywhere in the body, so they have these multi-systemic manifestations. In the case of MPS2, this enzyme is the iduronate sulfatase. It's a very important enzyme in the degradation of guides. And if this enzyme is not active, you have this uh, storage uh, around the, the body. And this, uh, as I said, this is uh, spread around the, the body, so you have uh, in patients with the neuronopathic phenotype to have a, a neurological involvement with development of delay and or speech delay. Uh, you have in all patients who have musculoskeletal manifestations, joint stiffness, for instance, you have a, a bone dysplasia that is typical for MPS. Uh, you have gastrointestinal manifestations like hepatomegaly, umbilical and inguinal area, recurrent watery diarrhea may happen. You have also some respiratory problems uh, like recurrent uh, uh, um, ear, nose, and throat manifestations, or recurrent otitis media, hearing loss, chronic rhinorrhea is very common, upper airway restriction, recurrent respiratory infections, also very common, and coarse facial uh, features. And then uh, you have also cardiovascular involvement. So there is a, um, these are just examples of what can happen in a MPS pooping. But a very important point is that the combination. So if you find this one of these findings, uh, if it is isolated, it's not that important in terms of MPS, but you have to get a combination of, let's see, viceromegaly, like in the larger liver and this, uh, uh, respiratory problems or hearing deaths, then you should be uh, alert to the possibility of an MPS. And one, one important thing is that there is a, a, a unfortunately, there is a, a delay, a long delay from the onset of symptoms and the, the diagnosis of MPS2. And this is interesting to, we made a survey and 
57% of MPS2 patients had surgery before diagnosis. This means that the patient was admitted to a hospital, uh, had a surgeon who evaluated him, an anesthesiologist, uh, nurses, and nobody was really suspecting of MPS. So it's important that we should uh, be aware about this early red flags of MPS to, to try to, to make the diagnosis um, earlier in life. And in fact, uh, the average diagnostic delay from a, a survey we made in um, over 100 families is about 5.9 years. So it's a, a large, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a very big number. We should decrease this number and uh, let's discuss about uh, how to do this. And uh, our patient, this is a picture of our patients. This is a patient of non neuropathic uh, uh, phenotype. He had multiple surgeries in early ch childhood, um, uh, inguinal hernia, adenoidectomy, tonsillectomy, and the, the diagnosis, the suspicion of MPS was not, uh, was not raised at that time. It just uh, was raised when he was six, seven years old. And uh, so there are a lot of missed opportunities for diagnosis along his life. So we, we had some uh, information that shows that MPS2 is hidden um, among childhood complaints and that any combination of signs, symptoms or surgeries in a young male patient should warrant referral for further investigation. Uh, but uh, in fact, uh, it's difficult to, to figure out that it's MPS2 uh, because it is hidden among the MPS and other MPS-like diseases. So it's very important to refer for testing upon suspicion, upon suspicion of MPS for an accurate and fast diagnosis. So let's talk now about this diagnosis. Oh, yeah. So the second part of our webinar is the young testing for MPS2. The current diagnostic testing procedure will be the first uh, my presentation and then we will discuss later the future trends. So um, it's very important that for the diagnosis, not uh, very easy to diagnose in terms of uh, the laboratory testing. So it's important to have centers that uh, are uh, are ex get, get experience with this diagnosis or uh, may establish some networks of services that uh, work together to, to have the, the tests done properly and uh, in a fast way. So in Brazil, I will tell you our, our experience, we established the MPS Brazil network to provide diagnostic support to doctors around the country who suspect of uh, MPS in, in a patient. So the first... Uh, Point is the, uh, the family that takes the, the child to the, to the doctor. And then the doctor, when, if he really suspects of MPS, he can collect samples of uh, blood and urine and send to the, send to the laboratory of this network. Usually, the, Brazil is a large country, the samples came by, by plane, and then they get, uh, we are in the very south of Brazil, so they arrive to, to our lab. And then we process these, these samples uh, in the lab. And then we reach uh, the, re the results were sent back to the doctor. So the doctor receives this and then he, he provides to the, to the family. And if there's a diagnosis of MPS, now he can manage it properly. So this, uh, with this uh, establishment of this network, we are able to uh, speed up the, the diagnosis of MPS. Uh, we, and many patients that were already there, they are become diagnosed and they are diagnosed faster in, 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 the, in a way. So this is a, is a very nice experience. So I will talk a little bit about the, uh, uh, an overview of the diagnostic testing process. We start in the top with a suspicion of MPS, so the clinical suspicion. And the first test we do is the uh, urinary gags, the total urinary gags. So we measure the total urinary gags. This is a colorimetric method, uh, not uh, very difficult. And then uh, if you have uh, increased 
urinary gags, we go to see which kind of gag is, uh, which species of gag is, is increased. If it's aparan sulfate, dermatosulfate, sulfate, or keratosulfate, sulfate, because they can indicate the type of MPS that is involved. And we do do it by thin layer chromatography or by uh, electrophoresis. And uh, also we have this information, we go to do the enzyme assay, to test the enzyme that is suspected to be deficient. And, uh, and so we, we test one, two, or a little bit more the enzymes until we have the, the enzyme that is uh, deficient. If there's a sulfatase deficient, like in MPS2, that is a duronate sulfatase, we need to assay a second sulfatase, at least one more sulfatase, to exclude a, a disease that is multiple sulfatase deficient, where you have uh, the, all sulfatase are deficient. And so if you find one sulfatase deficient, you have, you need to assay at least one, one more, one other to, to have this information about the, to rule out this multiple sulfatase deficient. So uh, also have these, find the enzyme deficient to have the MPS confirmed. And we can do, and we are doing now more and more genetic analysis that can co help to confirm the, to predict the phenotype, to help to in family history, help to identify carriers, maybe useful for prenatal diagnosis. So this is the overall flow of the diagnosis. Uh, it's very important that uh, if, if the total urinary gag that is the first step normal, you have to check uh, if this urine is not very diluted, if the age of the patient, because the gags, they decrease with age. And if you are, uh, your suspicion of MPS is still persists, you may do in a second, uh, another sample, or even to go further in the diagnostic investigation. And uh, also we, we, uh, have to just yes in, in this slide you see the the urinary gags you see the dots are the patients with mps you know you see that they decrease with age so the older the patient the lower the the gags and sometimes it approaches the upper normal level that is the the straight line below uh, lower straight lines the upper normal level sometimes the level of patients they they approach it. So it's very important to consider these variations when you assay the, the urine. And also it's important to avoid some methods that they were used in the past, like you see in the right, the Toledin blue spot test or the turbidity test that uh, they are have a high rate of false positives and false negatives. So avoid this, do the colorimetric measurement, but take care uh, with the very diluted space, uh, specimens and also with the age of the patient and variations that could occur. So uh, coming back to our, to our uh, flow, we can see the, the chromatography or electrophoresis is, is, today is something that we use, but we will, as I'll show in the end of the presentation, this, there is a trend to replace this form by methods a little bit more accurate. I will show you the, the next slide. You see the electrophoresis of gags. You see some patterns that you, in the, in the right, uh, left, you see the HS is the parasulfate and DS is dermatosulfate. If you found both in urine, you, this is a pattern that you can see in MPS1, MPS2, and MPS7. So we need to test just three enzymes to, to get your diagnosis. If you find the keratosulfate, KS, you, this is typical of Mercure, MPS4, but maybe Mercure A or Mercure B, so you need to test two enzymes. If you find only dermatosulfate, DS, is uh, almost sure you have MPS6, you have to test the enzyme to be sure. If you find only aparan sulfate, HS, this is typical MPS3, but there are four MPS3, 3A, 3B, 3C, and 3D, you need to test the enzymes. So then you differentiate the MPS. So next one. Uh, and here we, we, we see the, if the MPS is suspected, you see, we made a total urinary assessment, they are increased. If they are normal, you may consider to retest. Uh, then you go to this chromatography or a little more easy and you identify some, some groups of uh, results. So you, uh, as I told before, in the very 
left. If you find dermatin sulfate and heparin sulfate, you, this is typical of MPS1, MPS2, or MPS7. Then we test these three enzymes and we reach a diagnosis. And the, the others, according to the pattern, you can do different enzyme assays. And then uh, genetic analysis, uh, after you have a biochemical um, diagnosis, you, you may perform the genetic analysis and have a more precise uh, definition about the mutation. And this can be helpful for phenotype prediction or for family history studies for the prenatal diagnosis and so on. So the, and then, so uh, let's say, see our patient, what, uh, how he performed. So he had a very increase in the urinary gas for 195. The age-related upper limit is 106. And I insist that it's important to have age-related normal values because they, they vary with age. And the electrophoresis, it, he had heparin dermatosulfate. This is typical of MPS1, MPS2, and MPS7. But when you did the test for the MPS2 enzyme, we found a very, a very low activity, 3.3, and the normal, the lower normal levels on 122, so very low. But as it's a sulfatase, we need to assay another sulfatase to be sure that it's not multiple sulfatase deficient. We assay the aryl sulfatase B, and it was normal, 200, and the normal is between 72 and 176. In fact, it's a, a little bit increasing. Not, not clinically relevant. So MPS2 was confirmed, and then we went to the molecular genetics test. We found a mutation. It's a known pathogenic mutation, also found in the mother. So uh, this is useful for genetic counseling. And we can test other relatives if the family is interested and provide a more uh, robust uh, counseling to this family. So now I will I'll go to another part is the new, the, the prospects for the bio, improvement of biochemical di diagnosis. And there is a technique that was very recently uh, described that uh, can be very useful. It's based on the degradation of gags because e each enzyme uh, cuts the gags in a different point. So depending on the type of MPS, you have a different enzyme that is missing. And so the gags will be, that are stored in that patient will be different according to the type of uh, MPS. For instance, in MPS2, you have a sulfatase that cuts the, the gag molecule in the very beginning if the sulfatase is missing. And then you have a, a long uh, gag uh, chain that is stored. In other case, like uh, the uh, MPS3A, you, you have a, a different enzyme that cuts the gags in a different part, so you have a different chain that is stored. So if you are able to analyze this, this, the type of chain that is, that is present in the urine, you can uh, have an insight about the type of uh, MPS the, that patient uh, has. So this is a, is a very powerful method. Uh, and I think in the next slide, we can, you, it's a very powerful method. And uh, you, according to the uh, specific enzyme deficient, you have a specific uh, 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 gag chains with varying lengths that you can have a pattern that is very consistent according to the type of MPS. Of course, to analyze this, you need uh, uh, some equipment that, uh, that can detect these variations. So the next one. And, and then the, these equipments are usually the uh, tandem mass spectrometry with, um, uh, or mouldy tough um, equipment. And then they can detect a spectrum that uh, is related to the type of uh, gags that are stored. And a study that was uh, published in Australia, they tested patients with 10 different types of uh, MPS, and they found a sensitivity for 100% and a specificity for the type of MPS of 100%. So it's a very promising method. Uh, it tested 93 patients. They are correctly identified in one of the 10 
MPS subtypes they 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 were tested. And so this uh, this is a very promising method in terms of biochemistry to have a very precise definition of the types of uh, gags that are present in the urine and from these uh, predicting the type of uh, MPS the patient presents. Uh, so the next slide. Uh, so this uh, this novel uh, non-reducing ends gag analysis. The, the name this of, of this because the, the, depending on the enzyme deficiency, they stop the the reduce uh, the degradation of gags at, at different po points. So you can test for all MPS in one urine samples in one assay, and compared with traditional gag test has a higher sensitivity and specificity. Uh, comparison to age dependent normal range is not required as there you have an internal comparison between gag types uh, and in the shorter gag chains appears to vary less with age. So this is another advantage. And this, this test they reveals the MPS subtype. Therefore, confirmation by enzyme assays only requires one enzyme to be tested, decreasing the cost and time taken. Compared to with genetic testing, this is a functional assay showing the enzyme deficiency and gag accumulation. Therefore, it's more informative than a genomic test, which could review both. So this, uh, this test, biochemical test is quite precise and uh, could be used for newborn screening or to evaluate a response to therapy. So for, of course, for newborn screening, this test I mentioned is in urine, but it's being adapted also to, for, to use in blood and then may be suitable for, for newborn screen. So it's a, it's a very nice uh, advance in terms of uh, gag analysis. And I, I, in my opinion, coupled with the next generation signal, they will, uh, they will have a very good combination uh, with this information, the information, biochemical information, the molecular information, and you have a very precise uh, diagnosis. I, I have some just final comments about this uh, summary of our presentation. Uh, the one is that MPS2 can be hidden among childhood complaints, as we show it, and MPS2 can be hidden among other MPS diseases. A combination of signs, symptoms, and or surgeries in a young male patient should warrant referral for further investigation, as uh, Professor Esgur just mentioned. Don't attempt to clinically differentiate the MPS type. Just refer for testing. This is important. So suspect of MPS, don't be worried in they clinically say is MPS2 or MPS1. You refer for testing and you have the, the result. Establish spare testing centers or referral networks to make referral easy. This is very important and uh, to have this established. And within testing centers, follow best practice guidelines and hopefully employ new technology when it became, becomes available. And this is a moving uh, scenario. And so we'll have soon these uh, new techniques also available in many, in many laboratories. Thank you.